Well, we're going to start by doing some coding. Uh, this is an approach we're going to be talking about in a moment called uh, the top-down approach to study, um, but let's learn it by doing it. So let's go ahead and try and actually train a neural network. Now in order to train a neural network, you almost certainly want a GPU. A GPU is a graphics processing, a graphics processing unit. Um, it's the things that uh, companies use to help you play games better. Um, uh, they let your computer render the game much more quickly than your CPU can. We'll be talking about them more shortly, but for now uh, I'm going to show you how you can get access to a GPU. Um, specifically, um, you're going to need an NVIDIA GPU, because only NVIDIA GPUs support something called CUDA. Uh, CUDA is the language and framework that nearly all deep learning uh, libraries uh, and practitioners use to do their work. Um, obviously it's not ideal that we're stuck with one particular vendor's cards, and over time we hope to see more competition in this space, but for now we do need an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, your laptop almost certainly doesn't have one, unless you specifically went out of your way to buy like a gaming laptop. Um, so almost certainly you will need to rent one. Uh, and the good news is that renting access, uh, paying by the second for a GPU-based computer is uh, pretty easy and pretty cheap. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of options. Um, the first option I'll show you, which is probably the easiest, is called Cressel. Um, if you go to Cressel.com and click on Sign Up, or if you've been there before, Sign In, um, you will find yourself at this screen, which has a big button that says Start Jupiter, and another switch called Enable GPU. So if we make sure that is set to true, Enable GPU is on, and we click Start Jupiter, and we click Start Jupiter, it's going to launch us into something called Jupiter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook, in a recent survey of tens of thousands of data scientists, was rated as the third most important tool in the data scientist toolbox. It's really important that you get to learn it well, and all of our courses will be run through Jupyter. Yes, Rachel, you have a question or a comment? Oh, I just wanted to point out that you get, I believe, 10 free hours, um, so if you wanted to try Cressel out, um, you're, you're not yeah. having to, to pay right away. Yeah. I, he may have changed that recently to less hours, but you can check the fact or the pricing, but you certainly get some free hours. Um, the pricing varies because this is actually runs on top of Amazon Web Services, so at the moment it's 60 cents an hour. Um, the nice thing is though that you can always turn it, turn it on, you know, start your Jupyter without the, CP, without the GPU running and pay a tenth of that price, which is pretty cool. Um, so Jupyter Notebook is something we'll be doing all of this course in, and so to get started here we're going to find our particular course. So we'd go to Courses, and we'd go to FastAI2, and there they are. Um, things have been moving around a little bit, so it may be in a different spot for you um, when you look at this, and we'll make sure all the information, current information, is on the website. Um, now, having said that, that's you know the Cressel approach is, you know, as you can see, it's basically instant and and easy. Um, but if you've got you know an extra hour or so to get going, an even better option is something called PaperSpace. PaperSpace, uh, unlike Cressel, doesn't run on top of Amazon. They have their own machines. And if I click on, so here's, here's PaperSpace, and so if I click on New Machine, I can pick which one of the three data centers to use. So pick the pl one closest to you, so I'll say West Coast. And then I'll say Linux, and I'll say Ubuntu 16. And then it says Choose Machine, and you can see there's various different machines I can choose from uh, and pay by the hour. So this is pretty cool, for 40 cents an hour, so it's cheaper than Cressel, I get a machine that's actually going to be much faster than Cressel, 60 cent an hour machine, or for 65 cents an hour, way, way, way faster. Right? So um, I'm going to actually show you how to get started with, with the 
with the paper space approach um, because that actually is going to sh do everything from scratch You may find if you try to do the 65 cents an hour one that it may require you to contact paper space to say like Why do you want it? That's just an anti-fraud thing. So if you say fast.ai there um, then They'll quickly get you up and running. So I'm going to use the cheapest one here 40 cents an hour um, <clears throat> You can pick how much storage you want um, and Note that you pay for a month of storage as soon as you start the machine up right so don't start and stop lots of machines Because each time you pay for that month of storage um, I think the 250 gig seven dollar a month option is pretty good um, But you only need 50 gig so if you're trying to minimize the price you can go there um, The only other thing you need to do is turn on public IP so that we can actually log into this and We can turn off auto snapshot to save the money of not having backups <clears throat> All right, so if you then click on create your paper space uh, about a minute later uh, you will find That your machine will pop up here is my Ubuntu 1604 machine um, If you check your email You will find that they have emailed you a password so you can copy that and You can go to your machine and enter your password Now to paste the password you would press Control shift V or on uh, Mac. I guess Apple shift V um, uh, So it's slightly different to normal pasting uh, or of course you can just type it in And here we are now we can make a little bit more room here by clicking on these little arrows I can zoom in a little bit uh, and so as you can see we've got like a terminal that's sitting inside um, our browser Which is kind of quite a handy way to do it. So now we need to configure this for the course And so the way you configure it for the course is you type curl HTTP colon slash slash files dot fast dot AI slash setup slash paper space Pipe bash Okay, and so that's then going to run a script Which is going to set up uh, all of the CUDA drivers, um, the special Python uh, repo, uh, py Python uh, distribution we use called Anaconda, uh, all of the libraries, all of the courses, um, and the data we use for the first part of the course. Okay, so that takes uh, an hour or so, uh, and when it's finished running, you'll need to reboot your computer. Uh, so to reboot not your own computer, but your paper space computer and so to do that you can just click on this little circular restart machine button Okay, and when it comes back up, you'll be ready to go. So what you'll find Is that you've now got an anaconda 3 directory. That's where your Python is you've got a data directory Which contains the data for the first part of this course uh, the first lesson which is our dogs and cats um, and you've got a fast AI directory And that contains uh, everything for this course so what you should do um, is CD fast AI and from time to time you should go git pull and that will just make sure that all of your uh, Fast AI stuff is up to date um, And also from time to time you might want to just check that your Python libraries are up to date and so you can type conda and update to do that All right, so make sure that you've CD into fast AI And then you can type Jupyter Notebook All right, there it is so we now have a Jupyter Notebook server running and we want to connect to that right? And so you can see here it says copy paste this URL Into your browser when you connect so if you double click on it um, then that will actually um, uh, That will actually copy it for you Then you can go and paste it, um, but you need to change this local host um, to be the paper space IP address. So if you click on the little arrows to go smaller, you can see the IP address is here. So I'll just copy that and paste it where it used to say local host. Okay, so it's now HTTP and then my IP and then everything else I copied before. And so there it is. 
So this is the fast AI uh, Git repo and our courses are all in courses and in there the deep learning part one is DL1 and in there you will find lesson one dot ipy nb ipython notebook so here we are ready to go depending whether you're using Cressel or paper space or something else if you check courses.fast.ai we'll keep putting additional videos and links to information about how to set up other you know good jupyter notebook um, providers as well um, so to run a cell in Jupyter Notebook, you select the cell and you hold down shift and press enter, or if you've got the toolbar showing, you can just click on the little run button. So you'll notice that some cells contain code, and some contain text, and some contain pictures, and some contain videos, so this environment basically has um, You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a way that we can give you access to an, uh, a way to run experiments and to kind of tell you what's going on, show pictures. Um, this is why it's like a super popular tool in data science. But data science is kind of all about running experiments, really. So let's go ahead and click run, and you'll see that cell turn into a star, the one turned into a star for a moment, and then it finished running. Okay, so let's try the next one. This time, instead of using the toolbar, I'm going to hold down shift and press enter. And you can see again, it turned into a star and then it said two. So if I'd hold down shift and keep pressing enter, it just keeps running each cell. Right? So I can put anything I like, for example, one plus one is two. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, yes, Rachel. Oh, this is just a side note, but I wanted to point out that we're using Python 3 here. Yes, thank you. Python 3.6. So you get some errors if you're still using Python 2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it is important to switch to Python 3, uh, you know, now, uh, well, for fast AI, you Definitely. require it. Um, but, you know, increasingly a lot of libraries are, are removing support for Python 2. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Now, it mentions here that you can download the data set for this lesson from this location. Um, uh, if you're using Cressel or the Paperspace script that we just used to set up, it'll, this will already be made available for you. Okay? If you're not, you'll need to wget it as soon. Now, Cressel is um, quite a bit slower than Paperspace, and also it Um, there are some particular things it doesn't support that we really need and so there there are a couple of extra steps If you're using Cressel, you have to run two more cells, right? So you can see these are commented out They've got hashes at the start So if you remove the hashes from these and run these two additional cells that just runs the stuff the, the stuff that you only need for Cressel. I'm using paper space, so I'm not going to run it Okay, so Inside our um, data So we set up this uh, path to data slash dogs cats that's uh, pre-set up for you And so inside there you can see here. I can use an exclamation mark um, to um, uh, Basically say I don't want to run Python, but I want to run bash. Right? I don't want to run shell So this runs a, a bash command and the bit inside the curly brackets uh, Actually refers however to a Python variable so it inserts that Python variable into the bash command So here is the contents of our folder There's a training set and a validation set. If you're not familiar with the idea of training sets and validation sets, um, it would be a very good idea to check out our um, practical machine learning course, um, which tells you a lot about this kind of stuff, of like the basics of, of how to set up and run machine learning projects more generally. Would you recommend that people take that course before this one? Or? Actually, a lot of students who would You know as they went through these as said they they've liked doing them together um, So you can kind of check it out and and see um, the machine learning course um, Yeah, they cover some similar stuff but all in different directions So people who have done both since you know say they find it they they each support each other. Um, I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite um, But you know if I do if I say something like hey, this is a training set and this is a validation set and you're going I don't know what that means At least Google it, do a quick read, you know, because we're assuming 
that you know the very basics of, of kind of what machine learning is and does to some extent. And I have a whole blog post on this topic as well. Okay, and we'll make sure that we link to that from course.fast.ai. I also just wanted to say in general with Fast.ai, our philosophy is to kind of learn things on an as-needed basis. Yeah, exactly. Don't try and learn everything that you think you might need first, otherwise you'll never get around to learning the stuff you actually want to learn. Exactly. And that shows up in deep learning, I think, particularly a lot. <laughs> yes. Okay. So in our validation folder, there's a cats folder and a dogs folder, and then inside the validation cats folder is a whole bunch of JPEGs. Um, the reason that it's set up like this is that this is kind of the most common standard approach for how um, image classification data sets are shared and provided, and the idea is that each folder tells you the label, so there's each of these images is labeled cats and each of the images in the dogs folder is labeled dogs. Okay? Uh, this is how Keras works as well, for example. Um, <clears throat> so this is a pretty standard way to share um, image classification um, files. So we can have a look. Um, so if you go plot.im show, um, we can see an example of the first of the cats. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is a Python 3.6 format string, so you can Google for that if you haven't seen it. It's a very convenient way to do string formatting, and we use it a lot. Um, so there's our cat, um, but we're going to mainly be interested in the underlying data that makes up that cat. Um, so specifically, it's an image whose shape, that is the dimensions of the array, is 198 by 179 by 3, so it's a three-dimensional array, also called a rank 3 tensor. Uh, and here are the first four rows and four columns of that image. So as you can see, each of those uh, cells has three um, items in it, and this is the red, green, and blue pixel values between 0 and 255. So here's a little subset of what a picture actually looks like inside your computer. So that's that that's will be our idea is to take these kinds of numbers and use them to predict whether those kinds of numbers represent a cat or a dog based on looking at lots of pictures of cats and dogs. So that's a pretty hard thing to do uh, and at the point in time when this um, Uh, this, this data set actually comes from a Kaggle competition, the Dogs vs. Cats Kaggle competition, and when it was released in, I think it was 2012, um, the state of the art was 80% accuracy, so computers weren't really able to at all accurately recognize Dogs vs. Cats. So let's go ahead and train a model. So here are the three lines of code necessary To train a model, uh, and so let's go ahead and run it. So I'll click on this on the cell. I'll press Shift Enter, and then we'll wait a couple of seconds for it to pop up. And there it goes. Okay, and it's training. And so I've asked it to do three epochs. So that means it's going to look at every image three times in total, or look at the entire set of images three times. That's what we mean by an epoch. And as we do. It's going to print out um, the accuracy is the last of the three numbers it prints out on the validation set. Okay, um, the first two numbers we'll talk about later. Um, in short, they're the value of the loss function, which is in this case the cross entropy loss for the training set and the validation set. And then right at the start here is the epoch number. So you can see it's getting about 90% accuracy, and it took 17 seconds. So you can see we've come a long way since 2012, and in fact, even in the competition, um, this actually would have won the Kaggle competition of that time. The best in the Kaggle competition was 98.9, and we're getting about 99%. So this may surprise you that we're getting a, you know, Kaggle winning as of 20, end of 2012 or early 2013, um, uh, Kaggle winning. Image classifier in 17 seconds, um, but uh, and three lines of code, um, uh, and I think that's because like a lot of people assume that deep learning takes a huge amount of time, 
uh, and lots of resources and lots of data. Um, and as you'll learn in this course, that in general isn't true. One of the ways we've made it much simpler is that this code is written on top of a library we built, uh, imaginatively called FastAI. Um, the FastAI library is basically a library which takes all of the best practices approaches that we can find, and so each time a paper comes out you know, we, uh, that looks interesting, we test it out. If it works well for a variety of data sets and we can figure out how to tune it, we implement it in FastAI, and so FastAI kind of curates all this stuff and packages up for you, and much of the time, or most of the time, kind of automatically figures out the best way to handle things. Um, so the FastAI library is why we were able to do this in just three lines of code. Um, and the reason that we were able to make the FastAI library work so well um, is because it in turn sits on top of something called PyTorch, um, which is a really flexible deep learning and machine learning and GPU computation library written by Facebook. Um, most people are more familiar with TensorFlow than PyTorch because Google markets that pretty heavily, um, but most of the top researchers I know nowadays, at least the ones that aren't at Google, have switched across to PyTorch. Yes, Rachel? Um, and we'll be covering some PyTorch later in the course. Yeah, it's, I mean, one of the things that um, hopefully you'll really like about FastAI is that it's really flexible that you can use all these kind of curated best practices as much or as little as you want, and it's really easy to hook in at any point and write your own data augmentation, write your own loss function, write your own network architecture, whatever. And so we'll do all of those things in this course. So what does this model look like? Um, well, what we can do is we can Take a look at so what are the what is the the validation set dependent variable the y look like and it's just a bunch of zeros and ones right um, so the zeros if we look at data dot classes the zeros represent cats the ones represent dogs and you'll see here there's basically two objects I'm working with one is an object called data which contains the validation and training data and another one is the object called learn which contains the model right so anytime we want to find something out about the data we can look inside data. Um, so we want to get predictions for our validation set, um, and so to do that we can call learn.predict. And so you can see here are the first 10 predictions, and what it's giving you is a prediction for dog and a prediction for cat. Now the way PyTorch generally works, and therefore FastAI also works, is that most models return the log of the predictions rather than the probabilities themselves. We'll learn why that is later in the course. So for now, recognize that to get your probabilities, you have to get uh, e to the power of. Um, you'll see here we're using NumPy, NP is NumPy. If you're not familiar with NumPy, that is one of the things that we assume that you have some familiarity with. Um, so be sure to check out the material on course.fast.ai to learn uh, the basics of NumPy. Um, it's uh, the way that Python handles all of the um, uh, fast numerical programming, uh, array computation, that kind of thing. Okay, so we can get the probabilities using that uh, using np.exp. Um, and there's a few functions here that you can look at yourself if you're interested, but it's just some plotting functions that we'll use. Um, and so we can now plot uh, some random correct um, Uh, images and so here are some images that it was correct about okay uh, and so remember one is a dog so anything greater than 0.5 is dog and zero is a cat so this is what 10 to the negative 5 obviously a cat here are some which are incorrect right so you can see that some of these which it thinks are incorrect obviously are just the you know images that shouldn't be there at all um, but clearly this one which it called a dog is not at all a dog, so there are some obvious mistakes. Um, we can also take a look at um, which cats is it the most confident are cats, uh, which dogs are the most dog-like, the most uh, confident dogs. Um, perhaps more interestingly, we can also see which cats is it the most confident are actually dogs, so which ones it is it the most wrong about, and same thing for 
the ones the dogs that it really thinks are cats and again some of these are just pretty weird I guess there is a dog in there yes Rachel I was just say do you want to say more about uh, why you would want to look at your data um, yeah sure um, so yeah so finally I'll just mention um, the last one we've got here is to see which ones uh, have the probability closest to 0.5 so these are the ones that the, the model knows that it doesn't really know what to do with and some of these it's not surprising um, so yeah I mean this is kind of like uh, always the first thing I do after I build a model is to try to find a way to like visualize what it's built um, because if I want to make the model better then I need to take advantage of the things it's doing well and fix the things it's doing badly um, so in this case um, uh, and often this is the case I've learned something about the data set itself which is that there are some things that are in here that probably shouldn't be um, but I've also like it's also clear that this model has room to improve like to me that's pretty obviously a dog but one thing I'm suspicious about here is this image is very kind of fat and short um, and as we'll learn um, the way these algorithms work is it kind of grabs a square piece at a time um, so this rather makes me suspicious that we're going to need to use something called data augmentation that we'll learn about, le learn about later to handle this properly. Um, okay, so that's it, right? We've now built uh, we've now built an image classifier, and something that you should try now is to grab some data yourself. Um, some pictures of two or more different types of thing, put them in different folders, and run the same three lines of code on them. Okay, and you'll find um, that it will work for that as well, as long as that they are pictures of things like the kinds of things that people normally take photos of. Right. So if they're microscope microscope pictures or pathology pictures or CT scans or something uh, this won't work very well as we'll learn about later There are some other things we do to need to do to make that work, um, but for things that look like normal photos um, These uh, you can run exactly the same three lines of code uh, and just point your path variable somewhere else uh, to get your own image classifier um, so for example um, one student um, took those three lines of code, uh, downloaded from Google Images 10 examples of pictures of people playing cricket, 10 examples of people playing baseball, uh, and built a classifier um, of those images, which was nearly perfectly correct. Uh, the same uh, student actually also tried downloading seven pictures of Canadian currency, seven pictures of American currency, and again in that case um, the model was 100% accurate so you can just go to Google Images if you like and download a few things of a few different classes and see see what works and tell us on the forum um, both your successes and your failures so what we just did was to train a neural network but we didn't first of all tell you what a neural network is or what training means or anything uh, why is that Well, this is um, the start of our top-down approach to learning uh, and basically the idea is that unlike the way math and technical subjects are usually taught where you learn every little element piece by piece and you don't actually get to put them all together and build your own image classifier until third year of graduate school uh, our approach is to say um, from the start hey let's show you how to train an image classifier and now you can start doing stuff and then gradually we dig deeper and deeper and deeper and so the idea is that um, throughout the course you're going to see like new problems that we want to solve so for example in the next lesson we'll look at well what if we're not looking at normal kinds of photos but we're looking at satellite images 
uh, and we'll see why it is that this approach that we, we're learning today doesn't quite work as well and what things do we have to change and so we'll learn enough about the theory to understand why that happens and then we'll learn about the libraries and how we can change change things with the libraries to make that work better. And so during the course we're gradually going to learn to solve more and more problems. As we do so, we'll need to learn more and more parts of the library, more and more bits of the theory, until by the end we're actually going to learn how to create a world-class neural net architecture from scratch and our own training loop from scratch, and so we'll actually build everything uh, ourselves. Um, so that's the general um, approach. Yes, Rachel. Um, and we sometimes also call this the whole game which is um, inspired by Harvard professor David Perkins. Yeah, and so the idea with the, of the whole game is like this is more like how you would learn baseball or music. With baseball you would get taken to a ball game, you would learn what baseball is, you would start playing it, um, and it would only be years later that you might learn about the physics of how a curveball works, for example. Or with music, we put an instrument in your hand and you start banging the drum or hitting the xylophone, and it's not until years later that you learn about the circle of fifths and uh, understand how to construct a cadence, for example. Um, so yeah, so that's, this is kind of the approach we're using. It's very inspired by um, David Perkins and other writers of education. So what that does mean is to take advantage of this as we peel back the layers, we want you to keep like looking under the hood yourself as well, like experiment um, a lot because uh, this is a very code-driven approach. Um, so here's basically what happens, right? We start out looking today at convolutional neural networks for images, and then uh, in a couple of lessons we'll start to look at how to use neural nets to look at structured data, and then to look at language data, and then to look at recommendation system data. And then we kind of then take all of those steps and we go backwards through them in reverse order. So now, you know, by the end of that fourth piece, you will know um, uh, by the end of lesson four how to create a world-class image classifier, uh, a world-class um, structured data analysis program, a world-class language classifier, world-class recommendation system. Uh, and then we're going to go back over all of them again and learn in depth about like well, what exactly did it do and how did it work and how do we change things around and use it in different situations for for the recommendation systems, structured data, images, and then finally back to language. So that's how it's going to work. So what that kind of means is that most students find that they tend to watch the videos two or three times, but not like watch lesson one two or three times, then lesson two two or three times, then lesson three three times, but like they do the whole thing end to end, lessons one through seven, and then go back and start lesson one again. Um, that's an approach which a lot of people find when they want to kind of go back and understand all the details, that, are, that can work pretty well. So I would say, you know, aim to get through to the end of lesson seven, um, you know, as, as quickly as you can, rather than aiming to fully understand every detail from the start. So basically the plan is that in today's lesson you learn um, in as few lines as code as possible, with as few details as possible, how do you actually build an image classifier with deep learning? To do this, to in this case say, hey, here are some pictures of dogs as opposed to pictures of cats. Um, then we're going to learn um, how to look at different kinds of images, uh, and particularly we're going to look at images of from satellites. And we're going to say for a satellite image, um, what kinds of things might you be seeing in that image, and there could be multiple things that we're looking at, so a multi-label classification problem. From there, we'll move to something which is perhaps the most widely applicable for most people, which is looking at what we call structured data. Um, so data about uh, data that kind of comes from databases or spreadsheets, so we're going to specifically look at this data set of predicting sales, the number of things that are sold, um, at different stores, uh, on different dates, based on different holidays, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so we're going to be doing this sales forecasting um, exercise. After that, we're going to look at language, and we're going to figure out 
what this person um, thinks about the movie Zombiegeddon, uh, and we'll be able to figure out how to create, just like we create image classifiers for any kind of image, we'll learn to create NLP classifiers to classify any kind of language in lots of different ways. Then we'll look at something called collaborative filtering, which is used mainly for recommendation systems. Uh, we're going to be looking at this data set that showed for different people, for different movies, what rating did they give it. Um, here are some of the movies. Uh, and so um, this is maybe an easier way to think about it, is there are lots of different users and lots of different movies, and then for each one we can look up for each user how much they like that movie. And the goal will be, of course, to predict for user movie combinations we haven't seen before, are they likely to enjoy that movie or not? Uh, and that's the really common approach used for like deciding what stuff to put on your home page when somebody's visiting, you know, what book might they want to read or what, what film might they want to see or so forth. From there we're going to then dig back into language a bit more um, and we're going to look at, um, actually we're going to look at uh, the writings of Nietzsche, the philosopher, and learn how to create our own Nietzsche philosophy from scratch, character by character. So this here, perhaps that every life of values of blood of intercourse, when it senses there is unscrupulous his very rights and still impulse love, is not actually Nietzsche. Um, that's actually like some character by character generated text um, that we built um, with this recurrent neural network. Uh, and then finally, we're going to loop all the way back to computer vision again. Uh, we're going to learn how not just to recognize cats from dogs, but to actually find like where the cat is with this kind of heat map. Uh, and we're also going to learn how to write our own architectures from scratch. Um, so this is an example of a ResNet, uh, which is the kind of network that we um, are using in today's lesson for computer vision. And so we'll actually end up building the network and the training loop from scratch. And so they're basically the, the steps that we're going to be taking from here. Um, and at each step, we're going to be getting into um, increasing amounts of detail uh, about how to actually do these things yourself. So we've actually heard back from our students of past courses uh, about what they found, and one of the things that we've heard a lot of students say is that they spend too much time on theory and research um, and not enough time running the code. Uh, and even after we tell people <laughs> about this warning, uh, well, they still come to the end of the course and often say, I wish I had taken more seriously that advice, which is to keep running code. Um, so these are actual quotes from our forum. Uh, in retrospect, I should have spent the majority of my time on the actual code in the notebooks. See what goes in, see what comes out. Now, this idea that you can create world-class models in a code-first approach, learning what you need as you go, is very different to a lot of the advice you'll read out there, such as this uh, person on uh, the forum Hacker News, who claimed that the best way to become an ML engineer is to learn all of math, learn C and C++, learn parallel programming, learn ML algorithms, implement them yourself using plain C, and finally start doing ML. So we would say if you want to become an effective practitioner, do exactly the opposite of, of this. Yes, Rachel? Oh yeah, I was just highlighting that this is, we think this is bad advice and this can be very discouraging for a lot of people to come across things yeah, like this. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, we now have thousands, or well, tens of thousands of people that have done this course and um, have lots and lots of examples of people who are now running research labs or a Google Brain residence or, you know, um, have cre created patents based on deep learning and so forth who have done it by doing this course. Um, so the top-down approach works super well. Now, one thing to mention is like we've, we've now already learned how you can actually train a world-class image classifier in 17 seconds. Um, oh, I should mention, by the way, the first time you run that code, um, there are two things it has to do that take more than 17 seconds. One is that it downloads a pre-trained model from the internet, so you'll see the first time you run it, it'll say downloading model, so that takes a minute or two. Um, also, the first time you run it, it pre-computes and caches, 
um, some of the intermediate information that it needs and that takes about a minute and a half as well so if the first time you run it it takes three or four minutes um, to download and pre-compute stuff that's normal if you run it again you should find it takes 20 seconds or so so image classifiers you know you may not feel like you need to recognize cats versus dogs very often on a computer um, you can probably do it yourself pretty well um, but what's interestingly interesting is that these um, image classification algorithms are really useful for lots and lots of things um, uh, for example um, AlphaGo which became um, which beat the go world champion uh, the way it worked was to use something um, at its heart that looked almost exactly like our dogs versus cats image classification algorithm um, it looked at thousands and thousands of, of go boards um, and it, for each one there was a label saying whether that go board ended up being uh, the winning or the losing um, player and so it learnt uh, basically an image classification that was able to look at a go board and figure out whether it was a good go board or a bad go board um, and that's really the, the key most important step Uh, in playing go well is to know which which move is better um, uh, Another example is one of our earlier students um, who actually uh, uh, Got a couple of patterns for this work uh, looked at anti-fraud uh, he had uh, lots of um, examples of his customers mouse movements because they they provided kind of uh, these uh, uh, user tracking software to help avoid fraud and so he took the the mouse paths basically of the users on his customers websites uh, turned them into pictures of, of where the mouse moved and how quickly it moved um, and then built a image classifier that took those images uh, as input and as output it was was that a fraudulent transaction or not um, and turned out to get you know really great results um, for, for his company so image classifiers are like much more flexible than you might imagine so so this is how you know some of the ways you can use deep learning specifically for image recognition and it's worth understanding that deep learning is not you know just a word that means the same thing as machine learning right like what is it that we're actually doing here when we're doing deep learning instead deep learning is a kind of machine learning So machine learning was invented by this guy Arthur Samuels who was pretty amazing in the late 50s He got this IBM mainframe to play checkers better than he can and the way he did it was he invented machine learning he got the mainframe to play against itself lots of times and figure out which kinds of things led to victories and which kinds of things didn't uh, and use that to kind of almost write its own program Uh, and Arthur, Arthur Samuels actually said in 1962 that he thought that one day um, the vast majority of computer software would be written uh, using this machine learning approach rather than written by hand by writing the loops and so forth by hand So I guess that hasn't happened yet, but it seems to be in the process of happening um, I think one of the reasons it didn't happen for a long time is because traditional machine learning actually was very difficult and very um, Knowledge and time intensive. So for example, here's something called the computational pathologist or CPATH um, From a guy called Andy Beck Andy Beck back when he was at Stanford um, uh, He's now moved on uh, to uh, Somewhere on the East Coast uh, Harvard, I think um, And what he did was he took uh, these pathology slides of breast cancer um, biopsies right? and he worked with lots of pathologists to come up with ideas about what kinds of patterns or features might be associated with sort of long-term survival versus um, versus dying quickly basically and so he came up with these ideas like Um, well, they came up with these ideas like relationship between epithelial nuclear neighbors Relationship between epithelial and stromal objects and so forth and so they came up with all of these ideas for features These are just a few of the hundreds that they thought of and then lots of smart computer programmers wrote specialist algorithms to to calculate all these different features and then those uh, those 
uh, features were passed into a logistic regression um, to predict survival. And it ended up working very well. Uh, it ended up uh, that the survival predictions were more accurate than pathologists' own survival predictions were. And so machine learning can work really well. But the point here is that this was a an approach that took lots of domain experts and computer experts many years of work to actually to build this thing. Right? So we really want something something better. And so specifically I'm going to show you something which rather than being a very specific function with all this very domain specific uh, feature engineering We're going to try and create an infinitely flexible function a function that could solve any problem Right it would solve any problem if only you set the parameters of that function correctly And so then we need some all-purpose way of setting the parameters of that function And we would need that to be fast and scalable right now if we had something that had these three things then you wouldn't need to do this incredibly time and domain knowledge intensive approach anymore Instead we can learn all of those things with this with this algorithm So as you might have guessed um, The algorithm in question which has these three properties is called deep learning or if not an algorithm Then maybe we would call it a class of algorithms Let's look at each of these three things in turn so the underlying function that deep learning uses is something called the neural network Now the neural network um, we're going to learn all about it and implement it ourselves from scratch later on in the course But for now all you need to know about it is that it consists of a number of simple linear layers interspersed with a number of simple nonlinear layers um, And when you intersperse these layers in this way you get something called the universal approximation theorem And the universal approximation theorem says that this kind of function can solve any given problem to arbitrarily close accuracy as long as you add enough parameters. So it's actually provably shown to be an infinitely flexible function. Right. So now we need some way to fit the parameters so that this infinitely flexible neural network solves some specific problem. And so the way we do that is using a technique that probably most of you will have come across before at some stage called gradient descent and with gradient descent we basically say okay well for the different parameters we have uh, how how good are they at solving my problem and let's figure out a slightly better set of parameters and a slightly better set of parameters and basically follow down The, the surface of the loss function downwards. It's kind of like a, a, a marble going down to find the minimum and As you can see here depending on where you start you end up in different places right? These things are called local minima now Interestingly, it turns out that for neural networks partic in, in particular um, There aren't actually multiple different uh, Local minima There's basically just there's basically just one right um, or to think of it another way there are different parts of the space which are all equally good uh, so gradient descent therefore turns out to be actually an excellent way to solve this problem of fitting parameters to neural networks the problem is though that we need to do it in a reasonable amount of time And it's really only thanks to GPUs that that's become possible So GPUs this shows over the last few years um, How many gigaflops per second can you get out of a? Uh, GPU that's the red and green versus a CPU. That's the blue right and this is on a log scale so you can see that generally speaking the GPUs are about 10 times faster Than the CPUs and What's really interesting is that nowadays not only is the Titan X about 10 times faster than the e52699 CPU But the Titan X um, well actually better uh, one to look at would be the GTX 10 ATI 
uh, GPU costs about 700 bucks Whereas the CPU which is 10 times slower costs over four thousand dollars So GPUs turn out to be able to solve these um, neural network parameter fitting problems um, incredibly quickly and also incredibly cheaply uh, so they've been absolutely key in bringing these three pieces together Then there's one more piece Which is I mentioned that these neural networks you can intersperse multiple sets of linear and then non-linear layers In the particular example that's drawn here There's actually only one what we call hidden layer one layer in the middle and something that we learned in the last few years Is that these kinds of neural networks although they do support the universal approximation theorem they can solve any given problem arbitrarily closely They require an exponentially increasing number of parameters to do so So they don't actually solve the fast and scalable for even reasonable size problems But we've since discovered that if you create add multiple hidden layers Then you get super linear scaling so you can add uh, a few more hidden layers to get multiplicatively um, more accuracy to multiplicatively more complex problems and That is where it becomes called deep learning. So deep learning means a neural network with multiple hidden layers So when you put all this together, it's actually really amazing what happens um, Google started investing in deep learning in 2012 um, They actually hired Jeffrey Hinton who's kind of the father of deep learning and his top uh, student Alex Kajewski um, And they started trying to build a team um, that team became known as Google brain and because things with these three properties are so incredibly powerful and so incredibly flexible You can actually see over time how many projects at Google use deep learning uh, My graph here only goes up to a bit over a year ago um, But it's I know it's been continuing to grow exponentially since then as well uh, And so what you see now is around Google that deep learning is used in like every part of the business um, and so it's really interesting to see how um, This This kind of simple idea that we can solve machine learning problems using a an algorithm that has these properties um, When a big company invests heavily in actually making that happen uh, You see this incredible growth in how much it's used So for example uh, if you use the inbox by Google software uh, Then when you receive an email from somebody uh, it will uh, often Uh, tell you here are some replies um, That I could send for you and so it's actually using deep learning here to read the original email and to generate um, some suggested replies um, and so like this is a really great example of the kind of stuff that Previously just wasn't possible um, Another great example would be Microsoft has also a little bit more recently invested heavily in deep learning and so now you can Um, use Skype you can speak into it in English and ask it uh, at the other end to Translate it in real time to Chinese or Spanish and then when they talk back to you in Chinese or Spanish Skype will in real time translate the speech in in their language into English speech in real time um, And again, this is an example of stuff which we can only do thanks to deep learning um, I also think it's really interesting to think about how deep learning can be combined with human expertise So here's an example of like drawing something just sketching it out uh, And then using a program called neural doodle. This is from a couple of years ago to then say please take that sketch and Render it in the style of an artist And so here's the picture that it then created rendering it as a, you know impressionist painting Uh, and I think this is a really great example of how um, You can use deep learning to help combine human expertise and what computers are good at So I a few years ago 
decided to try this myself like what would happen if I took uh, Deep learning and try to use it to solve a really important problem and so the problem I picked was diagnosing lung cancer uh, it turns out if you can find um, lung nodules earlier um, There's a ten times higher probability of survival uh, So it's a really important problem to solve uh, so uh, I got together with three other people none of us had any medical background uh, and we grabbed a data set of CT scans uh, We used a convolutional neural network um, much like the dogs versus cats one we trained at the start of today's lesson uh, to try and predict which Uh, CT scans had malignant tumors in them uh, and we ended up after a couple of months with something with a much lower false negative rate and a much lower false positive rate than a panel of four radiologists uh, and we went on to uh, build this in a startup into, into a company called Enlytic which has really become pretty successful and uh, since that time uh, the idea of using deep learning for medical imaging has become uh, hugely popular And it's being used all around the world um, So what I've generally noticed is that you know the vast majority of um, Of kind of things that people do in the world currently aren't using deep learning uh, And then each time somebody says oh, let's try using deep learning to improve performance at this thing uh, They nearly always get fantastic results and then suddenly everybody in that industry starts using it as well So there's just lots and lots of opportunities here um, at this particular time to use deep learning to help with all kinds of different stuff So I've jotted down a few ideas here um, These are all things which I know you can use um, deep learning for right now to get good results from um, and You know are things which people spend a lot of money on or have a lot of uh, you know important business opportunities um, There's lots more as well um, But these are some examples of things that maybe at your company you could think about applying deep learning for So let's talk about what's actually going on um, What actually happened when we trained that deep learning model earlier? And so as I briefly mentioned the thing we created is something called a convolutional neural network or CNN and the key piece of a convolutional neural network is the convolution So here's a great example from a website um, uh, I've got the URL up here um, Explained visually uh, It's called uh, and the explained visually website um, has an example of a convolution um, Kind of in practice over here in the bottom left is a very zoomed in picture of somebody's face and over here on the right is an example of using a convolution on that image You can see here that this particular thing is obviously finding um, uh, edges, um, the edges of his head, right? Top and bottom edges in particular. Now, how is it doing that? Well, if we look at each of these little three by three areas that this is moving over, it's taking each three by three area of pixels, and here are the pixel values, right, for each thing in that three by three area, and it's multiplying each one of those. Three by three pixels by each one of these uh, three by three kernel values in a convolution this specific set of Nine values is called a kernel. It doesn't have to be nine. It could be four by four or five by five or two by two or whatever right? uh, In this case, it's a three by three kernel and in fact in deep learning nearly all of our kernels are three by three So in this case the kernel is 1 2 1 0 0 0 minus 1 minus 2 minus 1 so we take each of the um, uh, Black through uh, white pixel values and we multiply as you can see each of them by the corresponding value in the kernel and then we add them all together and So if you do that for every 3 by 3 area You end up with the values that you see over here on the right hand side Okay, so very low values become um, Black very high values become white and so you can see when we're at an edge where it's black at the bottom and White at the top. We're obviously going to get higher numbers over here and vice versa Okay, so that's a convolution So as you can see it is a linear operation 
and so based on that definition of a neural net I described before this can be a layer in our neural network It is a simple linear operation And we're going to look at lots more at convolutions later including building a little spreadsheet uh, that implements them ourselves So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a nonlinear layer so a nonlinearity as it's called is something which takes uh, an input value and uh, Turns it into some different value in a nonlinear way and you can see this orange picture here is an example of a nonlinear function specifically this is something called a sigmoid and So a sigmoid is something that has this kind of s shape and uh, this is what we used to use as our nonlinearities in neural networks um, a lot um, actually nowadays we nearly entirely use something else called a ReLU or rectified linear unit um, a ReLU uh, is simply take any negative numbers and replace them with zero and leave any positive numbers as they are so in other words in code that would be um, y equals max x comma zero so max x comma zero simply says replace the negatives with zero Um, regardless of whether you use a sigmoid or a ReLU or something else um, The key point about taking uh, this combination of a linear layer followed by a element wise nonlinear function Is that it allows us to create arbitrarily complex shapes as you see in the bottom right and the reason why is That and this is all from um, Michael Nielsen's neural networks and deep learning.com really fantastic uh, interactive book um, As you change the values of your um, linear functions um, It basically allows you to kind of like Build these arbitrarily tall or thin blocks and then combine those blocks together um, And this is actually the essence of the universal approximation theorem this idea that when you have a linear layer feeding into a nonlinearity you can actually create these arbitrarily complex shapes Um, so this is the key idea behind why neural networks can solve any computable problem So then we need a way as we described to actually um, Set these parameters so it's all very well knowing that we can move the parameters around manually to try to Create different shapes, but we have some specific shape. We want how do we get to that shape? And so as we discussed earlier the basic idea is to use something called gradient descent uh, This is an extract from a notebook actually one of the fast AI um, lessons um, And it shows actually an example of using gradient descent to solve a simple linear regression problem um, But I can show you the basic idea. Um, let's say you were just you had a simple um, Quadratic right And so you are trying to find the minimum of this quadratic right? And so in order to find the minimum you start out by randomly picking some point right so we say okay Let's pick let's pick here And so you go up there and you calculate the value of your quadratic at that point So what you now want to do is try to find a slightly better point So what you could do is you can move a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right To find out which direction is down and what you'll find out is that moving a little bit to the left Decreases the value of the function so that looks good, right? And so in other words, we're calculating the derivative of the function at that point Right so that tells you which way is down it's the gradient and so now that we know that going to the left is down we can take a small step in that direction To create a new point and then we can repeat the process and say okay Which way is down now and we can now take another step and another step and another step another step another step Okay, and each time we're getting closer and closer yeah. So the basic approach here is to say okay. We start we're at some point We've got some value X, which is our current guess right that at time step n So then our new guess at time step n plus 1 is just equal to our previous guess plus the derivative Right 
right, times some small number because we want to take a small step We need to pick a small number because if we picked a big number, right? Then we say, okay, we know we want to go to the left. Let's jump a big long way to the left. We could go all the way over here. And we actually end up worse, right? And then we do it again. Now we're even worse again, right? So if you have too high a step size, uh, you can actually end up with divergence rather than convergence. So this number here, we're going to be talking about it a lot during this course, and we're going to be writing all this stuff out in code from scratch ourselves, but this number here is called the learning rate. Okay, so you can see here, this is an example of basically starting out with some random line and then using gradient descent to gradually make the line better and better and better. So what happens when you combine these ideas, right? The convolution, the nonlinearity, and gradient descent. Because they're all tiny, small, simple little things, it doesn't sound that exciting. But if you have enough of these kernels, right, with enough layers, something really interesting happens. And we can actually draw them. So here's the So this is a really interesting paper by Matt Seiler and Rob Fergus, and what they did uh, a few years ago was they figured out how to basically draw a picture of what each layer in a deep learning net network learned. And so they showed that layer one of the network, here are nine examples of convolutional filters from layer one of a trained network, uh, and they found that some of the filters kind of learnt these diagonal lines, Or simple little grid patterns. Some of them learnt these simple gradients, right? And so for each of these filters, they show nine examples of little pieces of actual photos which activate that filter quite highly. Right? So you can see layer one. These learnt. Remember, these these are learnt using gradient descent. These filters were not programmed. They were learnt using gradient descent. Right? So in other words, we were learning. These nine numbers So layer two then was going to take these as inputs and Combine them together and so layer two had you know This is like nine kind of attempts to draw one of the examples of the filters in layer two They're pretty hard to draw but what you can do is say for each filter What are examples of little bits of images that activated them and you can see by layer two? We've got basically Something that's being activated nearly entirely by little bits of sunset Something that's being activated by circular objects Something that's being activated by um, Repeating horizontal lines something that's being activated by corners, right? So you can see how we're basically combining layer one features together So if we combine those features together, and again, these are all convolutional filters learnt through gradient descent, by the third layer, it's actually learnt to recognize the presence of text. Another filter has learnt to recognize the presence of petals. Another filter has learnt to recognize the presence of human faces. Right? So just three layers is enough to get some pretty rich behavior. So but the, by the time we get to layer five, We've got something that can recognize the eyeballs of insects and birds and something that can recognize unicycle wheels right? So so this is kind of where we start with something Incredibly simple right? Um, but if we use it as a, at a big enough scale um, thanks to the universal approximation theorem uh, and the use of multiple hidden layers in deep learning um, we actually get these very very rich capabilities So that is what we used when we actually trained Our little dog versus cat recognizer okay um, So Let's talk more about this dog versus cat recognizer So we've learned the idea of like we can look at the pictures that come out of the other end to see what the models classifying well or classifying badly or which ones it's unsure about Um, 
But let's talk about like this key thing I mentioned, which is the learning rate. So I mentioned we have to set this thing, I just called it L before, the learning rate. And you might have noticed there's a couple of numbers, these kind of magic numbers um, here. The first one is the learning rate. Right? So this number is how much do you want to multiply the gradient by when you're taking each step in your gradient descent? We already talked about why you wouldn't want it to be too high, right? but probably also it's obvious to see why you wouldn't want it to be too low. Right? If you had it too low, you would take like a little step and you'd be a little bit closer and a little bit step, a little step, a little step, and it would take lots and lots and lots of steps and it would take too long. So setting this number well is actually really important. And for the longest time, this was driving deep learning researchers crazy because they didn't really know a good way to set this reliably. Um, so the good news is, last year, Um, a researcher came up with an approach to quite reliably set the learning rate. Unfortunately, almost nobody noticed. So almost no deep learning researchers I know about actually are aware of this approach. Um, but it's incredibly successful and it's incredibly simple. And I'll show you the idea. Right? Um, it's built into the fast AI library as something called LR find or the learning rate finder. And it comes from this paper, Um, oh, it's actually a 2015 paper, sorry. Uh, Cyclical Learning Rates for Training Neural Networks by a terrific researcher called Leslie Smith. And I'll show you Leslie's idea. So Leslie's idea started out with the same basic idea that we've seen before, which is if we're going to optimize something, pick some random point, take its gradient, Right? And then specifically, he said, take a tiny, tiny step. Like, tiny step. So a learning rate of like 10 e negative 7. Right? And then do it again and again, but each time increase the learning rate, like double it. So then we try like 2 e negative 7, 4 e negative 7, 8 e negative 7, 10 e negative 6. Right? And so gradually, your steps are getting bigger. And bigger right and so you can see what's going to happen it's going to like start doing almost nothing right and then it's going to then suddenly the loss function is going to improve very quickly right but then it's going to step even further again and then even further again right let's draw the rest of that line to be clear Right? And so suddenly it's then going to shoot off and get much worse. Right? So the idea then is to go back and say, okay, at what point did we see like the best improvement? So here we've got our best improvement. Right, and so we'd say, okay, let's use that learning rate. Right. So, in other words, if we were to plot the learning rate over time, it was increasing like so. Right. And so, what we then want to do is we want to plot the learning rate against the loss. Right? So when I say the loss, I basically mean like how accurate is the model, how close in this case the loss would be, how far away is the predictive prediction from the from the goal. Right? And so if we plotted the learning rate against the loss, we'd say like okay, initially it didn't do very much, right? For small learning rates, and then it suddenly improved a lot, and then it suddenly got a lot worse. So that's the basic idea. And so we'd be looking for the point where this graph is dropping quickly. Right? We're not looking for its minimum point. We're not saying like where was it the lowest because that could actually be the point where it's just jumped too far. We want at what point was it dropping the fastest. So if you go um, So if you create your learn object in the same way that we did before, we'll be learning more about this, these details shortly. 
Um, if you then call lrfind method on that, you'll see that it'll start training a model like it did before, but it'll generally stop before it gets to 100%. Right? Because if it notices that the loss is getting a lot worse, then it'll stop automatically. Right? So that you can see here it stopped at 84%. And so then you can call learn.shed, that gets you the learning rate scheduler, that's the object which actually does this learning rate finding. And that object has a plot learning rate function, and so you can see here, over by iteration, you can see the learning rate. Right? So you can see each step, the learning rate is getting bigger and bigger. Um, you can do it this way, where you can see it's increasing exponentially. Uh, another way that Leslie Smith, the researcher, suggests is to do it linearly. Um, so I'm actually currently researching with both of these approaches to see which works best. Um, recently I've been mainly using exponential, but I'm starting to look more at using linear at the moment. And so if we then call shed.plot, that does the plot that I just described down here. Learning rate versus loss. Right? And so we're looking for the highest learning rate we can find where the loss is still improving clearly well. Right? And so in this case, I would say 10 to the negative 2. Because right? at 10 to the negative 1, it's not improving. Right? 10 to the negative 3, it is also improving, but I'm trying to find the highest learning rate I can where it's still clearly improving. So I'd say 10 to the negative 2. Right? So you might have noticed that when we ran our model before, we had 10 to the negative 2, 0.01. So that's why we picked that learning rate. So there's really only one other number that we have to pick, and that was this number 3. And so that number 3 controlled how many epochs did we run. So an epoch means going through our entire data set of images and um, using each each time we do a bunch of uh, they're called mini batches. We grab like 64 images at a time uh, and use them to try to improve the model a little bit using gradient descent, right? And using all of the images once is called one epoch. And so at the end of each epoch, we print out the accuracy and validation and training loss at the end of the epoch. So the question of how many epochs should we run um, is kind of the one other question that you need to answer to run these three lines of code. And the answer really to me is like um, as many as you like. Um, what you might find happen is if you run it for too long, the accuracy you'll start getting worse. Right? And we'll learn about that why later. It's uh, something called overfitting. Right? So you can run it for a while, run lots of epochs. Once you see it getting worse, you know how many epochs you can run. Um, the other thing that might happen is if you've got like a really big model or lots and lots of data, maybe it takes so long you don't have time, and so you just run enough epochs that uh, uh, fit into the time you have available. So the number of epochs you run, you know, that's a pretty easy thing to set. So they're the only two numbers that you're going to have to set. And so the goal this week will be to make sure that you can run not only these three lines of code on the data that I've provided, um, but to run it on a, a set of images that um, you either have on your computer or that you get from work or that you download from Google, um, and like try to get a sense of like which kinds of images does this seem to work well for, um, which ones doesn't it work, work well for, um, what kind of learning rates do you need for different kinds of images, how many epochs do you need, um, how does the number, the learning rate change, the accuracy you get, uh, and so forth. Like really experiment, and then you know try to get a sense of like what's inside this data object, you know, what do the y values look like, what do these classes mean, uh, and if you're not familiar with NumPy, you know, really practice a lot with NumPy, um, so that by the time you come back for the next lesson, um, you know, we're going to be digging into a lot more detail, and so you'll really feel ready to do that. Now, one thing that's really important to be able to do that is that you need to really know how to work with um, NumPy, the fast AI library, and so forth. And so I want to show you some tricks 
in Jupyter Notebook to make that much easier. So one trick to be aware of is if you can't quite remember how to spell something, right? So um, if you're not quite sure what the method you want is, you can always hit tab and you'll get a list of, of methods that start with that letter. Right? And so that's a quick way to find things. If you then can't remember what the arguments are to a method, hit shift tab. Right? So hitting shift tab tells you the arguments to the method. So shift tab is like one of the most helpful things I know. So let's take np.exp shift tab. And so now you might be wondering like, okay, well, what does this function do and how does it work? If you press shift tab twice, then it actually brings up the documentation. It shows you what the parameters are, and shows you what it returns, and gives you examples. Okay. Um, if you press it three times, then it actually pops up a whole little separate window with that information. Okay. So shift tab is super helpful. One way to grab that window straight away is if you just put question mark at the start. Then it just brings up that little documentation window Now the other thing to be aware of is increasingly during this course We're going to be looking at the actual source code of fast AI itself and learning how it's built and why it's built that way um, It's really helpful to look at source code uh, in order to you know Understand what you can do and how you can do it. So if you for example wanted to look at the source code for learn.predict You can just put two question marks And you can see it's popped up the source code, right? And so it's just a single line of code. You'll very often find that fast AI methods, like they're they're designed to never be more than about half a screen full of code, and they're often under six lines. So you can see in this case it's calling predict with tags. So we could then get the source code for that in the same way. Okay. Um, and then that's calling a function called predict with tags so we could get the documentation for that in the same way And then so here we are and then finally that's what it does it iterates through a data loader gets the predictions and then passes them back um, and so forth, okay, so um, Question mark question mark is uh, how to get source code single question mark is how to get documentation and Shift tab is how to bring up parameters or press it more times Um, to get um, the docs uh, So that's really helpful another really helpful thing to know about is how to use Jupyter notebook well and the button that you want to know is H If you press H it will bring up the keyboard shortcuts Palette and so now you can see exactly what Jupyter notebook can do and how to do it um, I personally find all of these functions useful uh, so I generally tell students to try and learn Four or five different keyboard shortcuts a day um, Try them out see what they do see how they work and then you can try practicing in that session And one very important thing to remember when you're finished um, With your work for the day go back to paper space and click on that little button um, Which stops and starts the machine so after it's stopped you'll see it says connection closed and you'll see it's off uh, If you leave it running you'll be charged for it uh, same thing with Cressel Um, be sure to go to your Cressel um, instance and stop it. You can't just turn your computer off or close the browser. You actually have to stop it in Cressel or in paper space. Um, don't forget to do that, or you'll end up being charged until uh, you finally do remember. Okay, so I think that's all of the information that you need to get started. Um, please remember about the forums. Okay. Um, if you get stuck at any point check them out, but before you do make sure you read the information on course.fast.ai for each lesson Right because that is going to tell you about like things that have changed. Okay, so if there's been some change to um, which uh, Jupyter notebook provider we suggest using or how to set up paper space or anything like that um, That'll all be on course.fast.ai Okay, thanks very much for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next lesson